Hey everybody, here is part one of tutorial three for the fall 2018 semester. Uh, we're doing sound reactive music videos in Max MSP, and we're going to move ahead with some new material. Uh, so first of all, I've uh, just started with the structures that we're familiar with. We've got a jit.world. I'm going to rename it because I already have a world of that name. Call it jit.world t3. There's my window into that world. Uh, now notice when I create a new world, even though this toggle is on, my world is off. Why? Because the on message, the one, was sent to the previous world and I've recreated it. So I'm going to turn off my toggle, turn it back on, and now I see you know, the, 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 this, this new world is running. And I have familiar structures here. I have an SF play 2 uh, channel with a large number here for the memory buffer and a 1 signaling that I want a time outlet. I have a snapshot tilde connected to the middle outlet of my jit.world and I'm dividing by uh, 1000 here to give me seconds. Uh, so a display of seconds uh, of the elapsed time of this audio track. Now I'm going to add a few things right off the bat here. First of all, right now we don't have a way to change volume unless we change it here for the whole patch. But I want to introduce a new object which is called live.gain. And live.gain tilde becomes uh, a set of level meters and a fader that allow you to control the volume of the sound. Whenever you create a live.gain, make it wide. Uh, because there's only two inputs on the top and they're easy to find, but you're, you, have, you have five outlets on the bottom and you only want to use the first two of them. And then once you've made the connections, you can squish that object narrow again, but make it wide to make your connections and then make it narrow. Now what does this do? This allows us to see the volume of the sound and turn it up and down. So let's take a sound here, um, drag it in and start it. And now I can fade that sound down, fade it back in, and importantly, I can see that this sound is actually playing, which is something we haven't been able to do before. Uh, notice I did something a little bit different here. I did Seek 3000. Previously, we've been working with Seek 0. Seek 0 takes us to 0 milliseconds into the file, the beginning of the file. And if we listen, there's dead space at the beginning before the drums come in. How much dead space? About three seconds. So instead of seeking to zero, I'm going to seek to 3,000. I'm going to seek to 3,000 milliseconds in, and that's going to start me right at the beginning of the sound, instead of having to wait through that silence. So what I'm doing here, as you can tell also, is I'm just, I just have a drum part. Right, this is the beginning of our working with stems. Um, and this is part of the reason why also we need the live gain, uh, because I can take this whole structure, copy it, connect my same seek and my same pause to it, and add another sound file. And as you can see here, I've got the stems for the song. I've got bass, drums, guitar, and then song, which is everything else, vocals, synthesizers. And I just put them into another SF play, connect both SF plays to the same output, and now, when I start these with the Seek 3000, they'll both, these two sound files will start, and I can control them independently. And I can do this with the remainder of the stems so that I have independent volume control of each of the four stems. So again, I take my SF play. And I'm doing this copying uh, by holding down the Option key, clicking and dragging. I can also just Command C and then Command V. That's also another valid way to copy. I can also Command D which is another option, uh, valid way. And uh, if I want to make multiple connections with a single chord, I can hold down the Shift key, make multiple connections. And then to erase a chord, you can hit Escape, or you can Command click in the blank space. Uh, so make multiple connections. And now all, my pause and my seek are connected to all four of these players. And then I'm going to connect all four of the players to my audio outputs. 
like so. I'm going to have all my connections there, and then I'll drag in the other audio files. I have guitar.aiff and song.aiff, and now I should hear the entire song. isolate each track individually and listen to it. These are not quite raw stems, they're somewhat processed stems of this song, see they're already in stereo, whereas uh, for instance the voices would have been recorded in mono on a single microphone, um, and the drums would have been recorded in more than stereo, probably across five mics. So these are semi-mixed, but we've got some, we've got, uh, we've got independent channels for four main areas of the songs, drum, and we can actually comment these drum, option click and drag, bass, guitar, and everything else over here. Now, one of the first things I want to show you, now that we have this, obviously this is going to be a very powerful tool for us, our screen is already full. And this is one of the problems we're already starting to run into Mac, in Max. What do we do? We have, you know, this is just something, this is just a starting place, right? This is just playing back our four stems. Um, and our screen is already full of stuff. So there's a very handy function in Max um, that we haven't looked at that is called encapsulate. And it allows us to take any part of our patch. We could take this whole sound thing that we just created and we can say edit encapsulate or command shift E and it sticks it inside an object. I call it P sound. And there that whole thing is inside there. If I double click it, it comes up in a new window. So this is how we deal with the complexity of patches is we put things inside sub patches and we're going to see this uh, in another mode uh, shortly. Um, so my entire sound playback portion of the patch is now tucked away inside this P and if I for any reason need to undo that I can simply say edit de-encapsulate and everything will pop back out and I can edit encapsulate and everything pops back in. And as we know in the sound, in the, in the convention of the class, this is in all caps because I can call this whatever I want. It doesn't matter, it's arbitrary, but that's my sound player right there. And you see what it does, it automatically creates an outlet of the patch so that this time outlet comes out of outlet one and flows to the snapshot tilde. And I can create additional inlets and outlets into this patch if I want them. So for instance, if I want, let's say I want my Seek 3000 to be outside the patch, I can simply create uh, an inlet there's my inlet right there, inlet under the plus menu, plus inlet makes an inlet that I can connect to my Seek 3000 so that I have a way of starting and stopping things from outside the patch. I can create inlet 2 to my pause button. And then here's a new uh, object that we haven't looked at, which is just B for button. Where if you have something you want to, you know, fire off, you can just connect a button to it. 
And now I have a start button and a pause button. My sound, my audio is on. Oh, right, all my sound files need to be reloaded. Um, that's why. Drums, bass, guitar, and song. Great, works perfect. Okay, so um, moving on from that, uh, I want to look at a few more things. Uh, also, the, one of the things that uh, we've been noticing is that a whole bunch of things need to be connected to this middle outlet of the JIT.world. For instance, let's say I'm going here and I want to do some analysis. Um, I just want to get the average amplitude of uh, each of each of my stems. So I do an AVG tilde of this. This is my average drum amplitude, my average bass amplitude, my average guitar amplitude, and my average everything else amplitude. Now I need to make a whole bunch of connections from here, from my middle outlet of my JIT.world world into this sub patch. So I can create a third inlet here and connect it to all my AVG tildes, and then I can go out of my patch and connect this to this, and I'm just creating more mess and more patch cables. And it works to do that, but there's a, there's a better way to make connections. You can make connections wirelessly using send and receive. So I can call this send, I'll just call it frame. Again, this is an all caps meeting. I can call it whatever I want, send frame. And then wherever I want it to go, I can say, receive frame. Whoops, got to spell receive right. I after E, except after C. I before E, except after C. Receive frame. And now I have this much nicer way to make that connection without creating too much more mess. Um, I'm sending my frame from here and receiving it over here uh, so that I don't have to create a new inlet and create all those additional patch cables. So I've got my four AVGs and I can use send and receive again to get them out. I can say send base oh, so that's drums. Send drum, send base, send GTR and send song, I'll call it song. So I've managed to do all my sound analysis in my sound patch without needing to create tons of inlets and outlets. And out here, I can do these as receives. And note that S and R are your uh, abbreviations for send and receive. So this is exactly the same as if I were to type out the REC, I before E, B except after C, receive, song, is the same as just R song. And there's a lot of uh, objects in Max that have, that have shortcuts like that. And each one of these is gonna show me the average amplitude of each of the stems. I showed you another new object in class, um, called multi-slider, which is a nice way to visualize numbers so that you can see them graphically. So here we can get little little level meters on our stems. And also we can of course use our floating point number boxes to monitor them, monitor them as well and see what's happening here. I'm shift clicking to select multiple and making them all a bit wider. And of course, what we didn't use in here is we didn't use the um, 
the um, <clears throat> cross tilde. So we could actually use the cross tilde here to isolate the kick drum out if we wanted to. Um, we could use like cross tilde 200. And put in another AVG here that just gives us access to the kick drum. And of course, that needs to be connected to the receive frame. Uh, and as always in Max, it's easy to create a mess. So we tidy things up by making some space so the patch becomes a little bit easier to read. Um, and a lot of people, you know, when I, when I say this to you, you say, uh, oh, it's fine, I don't mind. That's okay, but also do it because you know, we're just at the very beginning, and you don't mind now, but getting into good patching habits is going to help you when these things start to actually get complex. Because even though this looks complex, this is actually quite simple. Um, Command J will fix the width of all of these objects to make them a little smaller. So you can arrange things in the way that makes sense to you. Command J. And Command Y lines things up. There, now that to me is a much more readable, readable patch. Um, another thing you can do is you can option, click and drag, and then uh, uh, right click to change the, oh, option, click and drag, and then right click to change the color of things. I like to sometimes color my patch cords just so I can tell that they're doing something special. So I just made those yellow so that I can I know that they're my receive frame into my AVG tildes. And now I've got a new thing here, which is kick. And I should see that as a separate uh, separate level coming in. Nice. So now we've gone from, you know, we've gone from sort of a very simple analysis to a very rich analysis. Now you're going to ask, where did I get these stems? I just found them on the internet. I downloaded them. Um, you need to search around a little bit. Or if you, if you, you know, if you just want me to provide you with some stems, I can do that. Uh, so moving on from here, uh, what are some things that we've looked at uh, from the last class? Uh, well, we looked at... Uh, sine, cosine, and gate. So let's just take a quick look at those three things. Um, we'll do a jit.gl.grid shape, uh, shape of cube, uh, and we want to make sure it's in, it's in our world. I have a bunch of worlds here. I'm going to make sure it's in T3, um, and I'm going to give it a scale of Point two, and there's a nice cube sitting in my world. Uh, I'm going to show you something that's going to uh, help you to look around your world, which is uh, jit.gl.handle, which you attach. You can attach it to anything, but I think you should attach it to your world for now and give it a reset button. This is going to allow you to just take it, take your world and spin it around and look at it from different angles without having to necessarily move your camera around. So jit.gl.handle uh, sort of lets you inspect your world and then you can always reset it back to a normal view. Uh, we want to put some lighting enable on this cube so that the default lighting of the world gives it some three-dimensionality. And uh, when you click and drag on your on your jit.gl.handle, uh, you can hold down Option to zoom in as well. So it just gives you a little bit easier way to, to look at things in your world. So what, one of the things we looked at is how if we wanted to uh, create a continuous motion of this cube and we hooked it up to our snapshot tilde, We can move it in a continuous way. For instance, along the 
along the x-axis. But it's going to be a linear movement, not a cyclical movement. So let's start my music. So my, my, my cube is moving in response to the time of the uh, sound file moving forward, but it's going to keep moving in a straight line. So it's going to keep moving in the x dimension uh, positively, in a positive direction, uh, as long as the song keeps going. It's, not gonna, it's, not gonna, it's never going to come back onto the screen. So how do we turn a linear motion like that into a cyclical motion? And we looked at sine as a way to do that. Sine is always going to give us a cycle between negative 1 and positive 1 as a linear number moves forward. So take a look at this. So this is going to keep moving back and forth. Let's speed up the process a little bit. Let's just divide it by 2 here. The cube's going to just keep oscillating back and forth in response to the time moving forward. So sine takes a linear progression and turns it into a cyclical progression, or you could say a circular progression. And this is the trick of using sine and cosine. Because as I uh, mentioned in the, or as I gave you as a challenge in the quiz, can you think of a way to have an object move in a circle? Well, sine and cosine are out of phase with each other. So if we move, uh, well here, let's, let's, let's just move x and y using sine. We'll find that it moves in a diagonal. Right, it's moving from the top right corner, positive one, positive one, to the bottom left corner, negative one, negative one. So if we were to take it And so there's our solution to moving in a circle, right? Drive the x with the sine and drive the y with the cosine. Or if we want our circle to be in depth, we can say drive x with sine and z with cosine. And now it's a circle that's moving away from us and then moving towards us and away. And we can reset our handle to see this more clearly. It's moving circularly on a flat plane or could move in a circle like a Ferris wheel. So sine and cosine combined create circular movement. And again, here comes here's a nice opportunity to just encapsulate a lot of stuff. We can just take all of this positioning stuff that's going on and we can just say edit encapsulate and call this circle and now all that stuff is just stuck in there we don't have to deal with it anymore if we double click we can get to it we can edit it we can 
change the format, but we've got an inlet and an outlet that's doing this processing for us, and it's all tucked inside this box so we don't have to deal with it. Uh, so the next thing I want to look at is I want to look at gate. So gate allows us to pass information or not pass information based on some condition. So for instance, we could have this motion only happen at certain times. We can put a gate here, and the right inlet of gate is the information we want to turn on or off. And the left inlet of gate is our control. And it's controlled with a toggle, with a 1 and a 0. So I'll start the music. And when I turn the gate on, the information is passing through. And when I turn the gate off, the information is not passing through. Close the gate, open the gate, close the gate, open the gate. So then I can have a condition under which I want the gate to open. For instance, when the kick drum hits. So when I can say, I can say when the kick drum is greater than point, point let's say, zero 0.08, change So the, the, the rotational information is only passing through the gate when the kick drum hits. And we could do this, we could use anything for this. Um, this is just a, that's an example, a simple example of gate. I'll leave it at that and let you experiment with it. And of course, as I've mentioned many times in class, everything I'm showing you is just for the sake of your experimentation. Um, I'm not showing you this because I think it's a cool example. I'm not showing you this because this is what I want you to do. I'm showing you this to introduce the tool to you. And then I want you to do something vastly more interesting than what I'm showing. I'm just showing something quick and simple here so that these uh, tutorials don't take forever and ever. Uh, speaking of taking forever and ever, let me show you one more thing to close out this first part of the tutorial, which is adding a uh, material. to your shape. So we say jit.gl.material, and we just attach the material to the shape, and now this has some materiality to it, some, some quality to it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just home this. Make myself a little position zero button, click it, that takes this, oh, it doesn't take that cube back uh, until I'm going to have to disconnect that. There must be a position. Oh, no, I just misspelled it. That's all there is to it. Spelling will get you in trouble with, yeah, and reset this, and now I, now I have the, the cube in the center. Um, and we can see the cube has some shininess to it now, and in fact, uh, one of the things we can do with jip.material is change the shininess. Uh, default shininess is 16, so if you want something really shiny, you can give it like a shininess of 50, and that's going to be a very, very shiny. See how shiny that surface is now? That's your, that's your shiny cube. And now what we do with the material, it gives us more than just shininess. It allows us to map imagery onto the cube. So I can take any image. I can take, for instance, the uh, Devo album cover. I have it here somewhere. And just drag that album cover right into my patch. Create 
create a button again the same button with the B connect that to the image put the image into the first inlet of the jit.gl material and bam now we have Devo on our shiny cube that's pretty neat it does some odd mapping things um, that we won't that we won't deal with right now for right now what I'd recommend is to not use something like this but to instead take a more abstract shape like this until we deal with UV mapping and when we put that on it's gonna look good on every face of the cube quite quite beautiful actually now you see there's lots of inputs to the material because there's lots of other possibilities uh, for um, for ways in which to map imagery onto our shapes but for now we're just we're not going to deal with that we're just going to use this first input so we can so we can get shapes onto the cube and there's uh, and there's only or any 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 of the objects and there's one other thing I'm going to uh, tell you about this which is the image is going to stretch for instance if I double the width of this cube and make it a rectangular solid the image stretches so this is something to take in to take into consideration and again, if you're using sort of pattern images as I am here, uh, it looks pretty good when it's stretched. All right, so that's where I'm going to leave it for the first part of this tutorial, and there'll be a second tutorial where we get into um, sort of the main new concept for this week. Thanks very much, and please email me with any questions you have. It is so critically important that you come into class really understanding everything we've gone over. So in this tutorial, it was uh, creating patchers uh, using the edit encapsulate function, encapsulate here, command shift E. Um, it was using send and receive. Uh, it's using gate and sine and cosine, and also uh, the addition of the, um, the the inlets and outlets and uh, also the multiple SF plays and the live gain for playing back uh, for playing back stems nothing too complicated the complicated stuff will be in the next one but make sure you have all of this material really down uh, so that um, so that uh, you know we can move forward from here rather than needing to go over this stuff again all right uh, thanks very much and I'll see you in the next section of this tutorial